Imagine you're moving to a new city. You've just got a new job, and you're looking for a place to live. But everything you find is above your paycheck. Would you move in with five strangers, pay half your income in rent for a broom closet, or would you consider moving to a place like this? This is Co-op City in New York, America's largest affordable housing development. And although its architecture might look like low-income public housing, it's actually a subsidized middle-class cooperative. Believe it or not, 60,000 people call this complex home. For decades, policymakers, planners, and much of the general public have dismissed places that look like Co-op City as social and architectural failures, as housing of last resort. In my research and filmmaking, I propose the opposite, that Co-op City and other developments like it provide a template for the future of the American city. After all, despite its austere architecture, Co-op City is safe and well-maintained with shops and schools on site. If you earn between $25,000 and $65,000 a year, you can purchase a spacious one bedroom here for just $14,000. As you can imagine, the wait list is pretty long. With so many of our major urban centers increasingly divide between, uh, divided between rich and poor, middle-income projects like Co-op City have much to teach us. In fact, we need to ask ourselves, how can we build places like Co-op City again? In my dissertation, I explore the rise and fall of New York's post-war experiment with large-scale middle-income housing. While most middle-class Americans were busy moving to the suburbs, New York charted a different course, subsidizing private developers to build massive housing complexes for the city's workforce, for teachers and nurses, factory workers and police officers, and yes, professors too. To this day, you can find one of these middle-income developments in almost every corner of New York City. Across the rest of the country, subsidized departments soon became associated with concentrated poverty. But in New York, strong labor unions, a powerful tenant movement, and sustained demand for city living pushed city leaders to embrace a more expansive vision of mass housing. This was a vision that blurred the lines between public housing and the private market, as shown in this promotional video for Co-op City from the early 1970s. The goal of these projects was to house the so-called forgotten families who earned too much to qualify for low-income housing, but too little to rent or purchase on the private market. A parallel goal was to keep these families and their tax dollars in city limits in an age of suburbanization. Initially, middle-income projects predominantly served white families. But in the context of the civil rights era, several of New York's largest middle-income developments, including Co-op City, became pioneering experiments in racial integration, with different races and ethnicities living side by side in pointed contrast to the suburbs. At the time, the federal government backed suburban growth and offered little support for urban middle-class housing. As a result, New York was forced to develop its own specialized housing programs that leaned heavily on private partners. Indeed, while most scholars have emphasized the central role of government and labor unions in devising New York's uniquely generous post-war housing programs, I argue the reverse, that New York's liberal leaders, far from undercutting the capitalist housing market, opened up new opportunities for private profit in the middle-income tier. And it was precisely this partnership that enabled the city to develop such an expansive program of affordable housing. Some middle-income projects, most notably Co-op City, were developed by labor unions committed to the notion of a non-speculative housing market. But the majority were built by for-profit developers who used these programs exactly as they were intended, to build rent-restricted housing, often for a limited time period, in exchange for public subsidies. Just two notable examples. MetLife Insurance Company, at the time New York's largest private employer, invested in the massive Stuyvesant Town complex in Lower Manhattan. And Fred Trump, one of Brooklyn's biggest developers, built the enormous Trump Village in Coney Island. The city's middle-income strategy did not last. By the mid-1970s, with the city suffering from depopulation and economic decline, the motivations for middle-income development evaporated. 
Fast forward 50 years, however, and the situation has changed dramatically. In the context of a surging real estate market, these projects now play a key role shoring up the city's economic diversity. Unfortunately, those same pressures are also pushing some landlords to convert their properties to market rates. Some are even being branded today as luxury apartments. The loss of these affordable units is no surprise. From early on, these programs incorporated privatization clauses, enabling developers to exit affordability under certain conditions. Without these incentives, it is doubtful whether developers like Trump or MetLife would have built them in the first place. A major challenge facing policymakers today is to develop more robust subsidy mechanisms to incentivize landlords to maintain affordability in the longer term. Today, New York's population is growing rapidly. It's also growing increasingly unequal. Over the past 15 years, while the city's population grew by 7%, its number of middle-income households, those earning between $40,000 and $100,000 a year, actually shrank by 3%. Meanwhile, almost a third of the city's middle-income renters are rent-burdened, meaning that they pay more than 30% of their pre-tax income towards rent. These are the sorts of people that make a city work. Teachers, nurses, police officers, artists, immigrant entrepreneurs. And these are exactly the sorts of people that projects like Co-op City continue to cater to. So how might we move forward? And what might we learn from the past? Think about who built the last generation of middle-income housing. Labor unions, major employers, and real estate developers. These actors are heavily, if not exclusively, invested in city life. They all have a stake in housing the workforce that will sustain urban economic growth in the longer term. And with the federal government missing in action once more, state and local governments will have to lean heavily on private partners. So who has an interest in housing the workforce in our nation's priciest cities? While the history is unique to New York, I think these lessons apply to the other cities around the country that are struggling with skyrocketing housing costs. Whether partnering with universities, hospitals, or pharmaceutical companies in Boston, or the tech sector in the Bay Area, we must forge a new consensus to housing the middle class and securing a fairer future. Thank you very much.